Hey, we're, we're in a series that's really launching this whole year, and we're calling it a year of transformation. And I want you to look at this verse. If you've got an outline, grab an outline. We're going to jump right into this. But look at this verse. It's an incredible promise from God's Word in Psalms 65 and verse 11. It says, you crown the year. That word crown means that you encompass it, you circle it, you surround it with your goodness. God's saying, I want to surround your year with my goodness. How many would like that? You know, most people approach the future with often fear, trepidation, high levels of anxiety, uncertainty. God is saying, I want you to approach your future with a confidence that I am circling you, surrounding you with my goodness. There's a phrase I like, and you can help me out with it. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. That's why the psalmist said, goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. But there's a kind of a requirement if goodness and mercy is going to surround me and if goodness and mercy is going to follow me, the rest of the verse says that your path, not my path, but your path drips with abundance or provision. And here's what God is saying. If you'll get on the path that I have for you, you're on a collision course for my provision. You're on a collision course for my supply. You're on a collision course with my goodness. Uh, you know, how, how many know that God does not live in our time? God lives outside of time, and so God is already at the end of your life waiting for you to get there. He's with you today, but He's also with, with you at the end. And so God declares the end of a thing from its beginning. Think of it this way. God is saying, I've got, I've got your reservations made for you. All you have to do is go to the airport and ask for your ticket, and it's there. You get on the plane, and when you, the plane lands, there'll be a driver there for you. And the driver's going to take you to a place that I've set up for you. And that's what God is saying. I've, I've, I've got it. You just got to get on the path. And that's what we're talking about. Getting on the path that takes us to the place that helps us find the purpose and God's provision for our life. And so this is the year of transformation. That's what we're calling it. So this series that I'm in today is, is the first step of what we're really going to be emphasizing throughout this year about sowing into the Spirit, if you will, laying a foundation that we build on for the next seasons of our life, the next chapters of our life. This becomes a foundational year. And, and think of it this way. If your faith is here, God wants to take your faith to here. If you have no faith, that's all right. God wants to help you have some faith. Maybe your faith has been devitalized or become stagnant, and God is saying, I want it to be revitalized and impassioned again. And so this is a year, when you think of it, not just a month or a few days or one church service, but a year of going on a faith journey, a faith adventure to see what God has already prepared for you his abundance, his blessings, his provision, if we all just get on that path. Amen? So let's jump into this. In Luke chapter 13 is the foundational thought for giving God a year. And, and I know some of you say, well, pastor, shouldn't I give God my entire life, my whole life? Yes. But how many know sometimes we need a starting point? How many times, sometimes we need a fresh start and a new beginning? And that fresh start, new beginning, like I said a moment ago, becomes the foundation that I build on, that I lay, that I build on for years to come. Or the foundation that I lay, that I live in, or establish my life on for years to come. How many know you can do something in one season of your life that you use for other seasons? You can go to school and get a degree that helps you with your career. You can sow into the Spirit that lays a spiritual foundation in your life that allows God to continue to do something in your life for the next chapter. Now, in this passage of Scripture, before I read the parable, let me give you the backdrop of this. Jesus is with his disciples, and, and they begin to tell him about current events, what's going on. They said, Jesus, had you hear about what Pilate did to some Galileans? He took the Galileans and, and 
Pilate was a brutal dictator, brutal king, and he, he established his authority by cruelty. And he had Galileans killed, and then he took their blood and mingled it in the sacrifice and made sport of it, and, and, and it was horrific. And, and Jesus, when he heard this, he, he asked him, let me ask you a question. Jesus asking his disciples, do you think that happened to those Galileans because they were worse sinners than other Galileans? That's a great question, huh? How many know some people think, I just deserve evil, I deserve bad? Jesus' response was, no, that didn't happen because they were worse. But then he said something very interesting. But unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then Jesus throws in another current event. He goes, you heard about the tower in the city of Siloam that fell on 18 people and killed them. He asked the question again, do you think that those people were terrible, worse sinners because the tower fell on them? And he said, I tell you, no. But unless, he says it again, unless you repent, repent simply means to change course, to change your path, change the direction. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. How many know we have no guarantee of the future? How many know all we have is today? And you and I get to decide what we do with today. And then Jesus breaks into this parable. So the parable comes from the backdrop of what he's just been talking about, change your path. And he says to them, he also spoke a parable to them that a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and he found no fruit. He found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and, and have found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he, the keeper, answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if it doesn't, then you can cut it down. Here's what Jesus is saying in this parable. Give me a year of your life to turn things around for you. Give me a year of your life to change the direction and the directory of your life. Give me a year of your life to change from empty to fulfilled, from fruitless to fruitful, from barren to flourishing. Give me a year. He asked for three things. Jesus asked for three things. This is what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. Number one, he says, give me a year, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Give me a year to bond with you. Secondly, he said this, let me dig it. We're going to talk about that next week. It's going to be really important you hear this because God wants to dig some things up in our life that hinder our relationship with God. It's critical that you understand this. We'll, we'll touch on it a little bit in just a couple minutes. The third thing he says, then let me fertilize it. I love what the King James says. The King James says, let me dung it. How many know the idea of having dung put on you just doesn't sound good at all? How many know God says, I, I need to bring some things into your life that won't sound good to you, won't smell good to you, won't look good to you, won't taste good to you, but if you'll receive it, it'll help you grow. Yeah. Come on, how many parents understand that? How many, how many parents understand you want to say some things to your kids, but their kids just want to hold their nose? Right? I don't want to eat that. It's like, no, it's good for you. No, it, it tastes like dung. No, it'll help you grow. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in a few weeks. But today I want to jump into this thought, give God a year to bond. If I'm going to experience genuine transformation, Jesus said, give me a year to work in your life. Give me, give me a year to lay the foundation to bond with you. And look what he says here in this verse. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15, he says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So Jesus, he uses the analogy of a tree in a vineyard, a parable that we started with. Now he's talking about, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He's using another analogy, that, that without abiding in the vine, the branch can't bear any fruit. And so here's the first thought. If I want to learn to connect with God, I've got to abide in Christ to bond with Christ. 
If I'm going to bond, I have to abide. Well, what, what does abide mean? Abide simply means to stay in place, to stay in relationship, to stay engaged, to stay in fellowship. In other words, it's, it's this ongoing abiding type of relationship that God says, if you want to bond with me so you bear fruit, you have to abide with me. Now, he goes on to make this incredible promise a couple verses later in John chapter 15 and verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so, you be, so will you be my disciples. I love this verse because here's what he's saying. God says, if you will abide in me, I promise you, you will get the desires of your heart. Anybody here desire some things from God? I, I will tell you this, that when you start abiding in God, what you desire starts changing. Notice, it isn't fruit to branch to vine. It's vine to branch to fruit. (laughs) No, we get this mixed up all the time. It's like, God, I I need this fruit area of my life. I need something pleasant. I need something healed. I need something restored. And so my fruit's messed up, so I'm going to take my vine and I'm going to try to connect it to you so somehow I get the fruit healed. And that can happen occasionally, but that's backwards. You abide in the vine, and the vine determines the fruit that hangs off the branch. See, when I came to Christ, my life was broken. I didn't know that God had a church in me. I didn't know that you were in me. I didn't know this life was in me. I didn't know the gifts and talents of God that he's put in my life. I didn't know all the things that would come out of my life these three and a half decades. They were not the desires of my heart at that time. Oh, you're not catching this. If you try to abide to get what you want, you're now trying to manipulate the relationship, and that's not bonding. And that's why religion don't work for you. Because it's called manipulation. I know I'm challenging this right now, huh? I feel like I'm more in a leadership session than a spending time with my Sunday morning family. <laughs> but when I abide in the vine, the vine determines the fruit that starts coming out of my life. Trust me, before I started hanging out with Jesus, I didn't want to hang out in church on Sunday morning, especially when there's some great football games on today. I had no desire to get up this early and go to church before I started abiding. But I will tell you this, I am so glad I have not spent the last three and a half years of my life, or th- three and a half decades of my life sitting in front of a TV on Sunday morning. That would have been an empty fruit. That would have been a waste of my life. And this is where I'm talking about Abiding. He says, I will give you the desires of your heart, and herein is my Father glorified that you bear much, not a little, much. God wants to bless you abundantly. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think or even imagine according to his power that he wants to work in your life. But it requires that I abide in the vine. So, so how, what, what does that mean? Abiding becomes the lifeline. It's the communication. It's the dialogue. It's the interaction. And this is where we could talk about spiritual habits. This is the things like prayer and reading your Bible and spending time with God and worshiping and going to church. And I could go through a whole laundry list of spiritual habits that would all be very, very good. But that leads me to point number two, though. Spiritual habits become empty traditions unless you bond with Christ. This is really, if you hear this next point, it has the potential for you to change what the rest of your life looks like in your faith. Spiritual habits become empty traditions unless I bond with Christ. Let me break this down for a minute. 
back up a little bit. In John chapter 14, Jesus says this, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. You are not born a Christian. You might have been born in a Christian home, but being born in a Christian home does not make you a Christian or a, in Christ. You, you, you might have been sprinkled, baptized, or confirmed as a child, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but that does not make you a Christian. You're born a person. You have to be born again to become a Christian. He says, I will not leave you orphans. Here's what he's saying. You and I did not grow out of the branch. We have to be grafted in. Excuse me. We did not grow out of the vine. We have to be grafted into the vine. He says, I will not leave you orphans. In other words, I have to be grafted in. So God opens up a place inside of himself, cuts a place. It's called the sacrifice of Christ. And when I put myself in there and I take hold, it takes hold. All of a sudden, the branch can live now and bear fruit. Yeah. Hang in there with me. But sometimes orphans struggle to connect into the family they've been adopted into. Oh, this is really good right now. God says, you're an orphan, but I'll make you my family. When the children of Israel, we'll break this down much more next week. When the children of Israel, God brought them out, he said, you're the apple of my eye. They said, no, you hate us. No, I love you. No, you hate us. And some of you do not know how much God loves you because you've not bonded. And they said, you don't have the power to deliver us. They said, look, I've done 10 miracles. I can do this thing. I split Red Seas. I, I did all the plagues. I, I brought water out of the rock. I, I, I've done this. No, no, you, you can't help us. We're, we'll be victims. God could not get past their belief system. They did not bond with him. Listen carefully. You can grow up in church, but that does not mean you've grown up in Christ. You can grow up in religion, but that does not mean you've grown up in Christ. I could go on. And, and this is what happens to a lot of people. They grow up in all of the religious traditions. They grow up in church every week. They grow up in the denomination. They grow up in all of the religious habits and traditions, but they never adopted or connected and grew up in Christ. Oh, come on, somebody. And now because I don't grow up in Christ, and now I have a crisis of my faith, have a giant to fight, have a problem to solve, I've got difficulty to deal with, I don't believe God loves me, I don't believe God helps me, and I'm not even sure he really exists. And I'm not trying to put anybody down, I'm trying to be where we live. How many know we can, how many had live Christmas trees in their house? <laughs> Yeah, some of you did. You know, you, know, you, know, you know, we call it a live Christmas tree. No, it's not a live. The minute, now you cut it. <laughs> you killed it. <laughs> you put it on life support for a little bit so you can just spend a month with it, throw some water on it, and then decorated it to make it feel better about itself. Here, let me put some lights on you. Let me hang some tinsel on you and some ornaments on you and aren't you wonderful and it's like dying <laughs> and no matter how much you decorate it it's not connected and no matter how much I decorate you as a Christian or church attender no matter how much sparkle we put on you how many lights we hang on you how many traditions and habits you participate in if you're not abiding you're dying Spiritual habits become empty traditions unless you're bonded with Christ. And this is where when people have these challenges, the big buzzword today is deconstruction. 
I'm giving up on church. I'm giving up on religion. I'm giving up. And I often wonder if you, de deconstruction can be a good thing. How many know sometimes you need to tear something down so you can build something back? I've gone through seasons of deconstructing my belief system at different times. But what I've never done is denounced my faith in Christ. I've deconstructed some of my habits. I've deconstructed some of my approaches. I I've reevaluated some things, and that can be a good thing. Denouncing is a problem. Right. When a person denounces their faith, they denounce their walk, I often wonder, then what were you bonded to? You did all the habits, but how can you be bonded and then disconnect? Because, see, when Peter, the disciple, denounced that I deny him and I'm going back, Jesus said, no, no, no. Before I go to heaven, Peter, you and I have to have a conversation, if you know your Bible. I mean, Jesus has died, rose from the dead, getting ready to go to heaven. Before he leaves, he says, Peter, where's Peter? He's fishing. Let me go get Peter. So Jesus is on his way to the right hand of the throne of God and says, Peter, you and I need to have a conversation. Let's have breakfast. I'm buying. <laughs> Peter, do you love me? I'm not talking about the other disciples. I'm not talking about who got your feelings hurt. I'm not talking about your disappointment in this. I'm asking you this question. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Ask him a second. I'm Peter. I'll ask you again. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. He asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me? Not religion, not all this other stuff, not all that foolishness. Me, Peter, me. Peter begins to cry. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know whether I love you or not. I think I love you. And then he says, Peter, then follow me. Knock this off and get back on mission. You can deconstruct all you want, just don't denounce. You can evaluate your belief system all you want, but don't lose your faith in Christ, the vine. Because your faith in the vine is where the fruit of your life will come from. Is this making any sense? He goes on to say, he goes on to say in, in the next verse here, in, 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 verse, in verse 20. Actually, can you go back one more verse for me? A little while, in John 14, 19, a little while longer, and the world will not see me no more. That's interesting. How many know that if you don't abide in Jesus, he just starts disappearing from your life? If you don't abide, all of a sudden, the football game becomes more important than church. All of a sudden, if you don't abide, you just don't, you just don't think about him. He just kind of disappears. And here's what Jesus said. The world is not in me and I'm not in the world. Come on, somebody. So the world don't see me, but you, watch this. This is, this is powerful if you catch this. But you will see me because why? Why do you see Jesus? Why do you, he's saying to, he's saying to this, why, why, why you, you will see me because I live. And when I live, you live. Now, no, no, I could, I could get Pentecostal right now <laughs> and just open up the doors and let me run around the auditorium a few times. Because <laughs> when Jesus is alive to me, I'm alive. Yeah. Now, my denouncing that he's not alive does not make him not alive. It just makes him not alive in me. Right. When Jesus is not alive, I'm not alive. But when Jesus is alive, I'm alive. Are you catching this? That's what Jesus is saying. I will not leave you orphans. I will graft you in. And if I graft you in and you see me as your source, you will live. And if you live, you'll bear fruit. It goes on to say now in verse 20. At that day, you will know this is the day I'm no longer an orphan. This is the day I no longer question God's love. This is the day I no longer question his power. This is the day that I know, this is the day that you will know that I am in the Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. Look what Jesus said. That day you will know that I'm connected to my Father, but I'm also connected to you, and you will now become 
connected to me. And in that day, in that day, you no longer have an orphan heart. How many would be honest? And at the end of the service, I'm going to pray. Some of you struggle with an orphan heart. God, I don't know that I fit. I don't know that I belong. I don't know who I am. I don't know my calling. I don't know my identity. I don't know my place. Those are fair, legitimate questions because those come from the orphan heart. And that's what God says. I know you don't know. That's why I'm adopting you. I'm adopting you. I'm not your foster parent. I'm your parent. I've adopted you into my family and I give you a full inheritance in my family. I give you a call. I give you gifts and talents. I give you ability. I give you purpose. I will never leave you. I am a good father. I will lay my life down for you. That's the transformation. But you've got to bond before you believe. The bonding helps me to believe. And that brings me to point number three. Point number three, this gets back to some of the habits that we talked about. I need habits, but habits become tradi empty traditions unless I bond. But habits also help me bond. So number three is to bond with Christ, to bond with Christ and be transformed. I need to create a cubicle or a cocoon of transformation for my life. John, excuse me, Romans chapter 12 says it this way. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, because of God's goodness, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. When God says it's your reasonable service because of how good he is, the best thing for you to do is to present your lives a living sacrifice to God. Now, I, we, get, we can get hung up on that sometimes because we're like, okay, that's sacrifice my life. It's like running into the house that's on fire to save somebody and lose my life. No, it's not referring to a one-time event. A living sacrifice is referring to a lifestyle or a structure of living your life in a way that's giving it away to the goodness of God. It's the habits, it's the rhythms, it's the structure, it's the, it's the routines, it's, it's, it's the systems of your life that you begin to create these systems that I'm giving my life away. When I said yes to God to pastor this church three and a half decades ago, now that I can look back after all those years, I could add up how much of my life I've given as a living sacrifice. And I will say that's the best thing I've ever did with my life. Is this making any sense? It's, so it's not a one-time event. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that God's trying to create for us. It goes on to say in the next verse, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. If I'm truly going to experience transformation, I have to renew my mind. Renewing my mind is the key to transformation. So when the Apostle Paul says, be transformed, don't be shaped by this world. Don't be conformed to this world. The, the reality is you and I were born into this world. Going back to the analogy of, 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 of someone in, in foster care being adopted, the reason sometimes is because of the families they've come out of. The families of origin were dysfunctional. The families of origin were abusive. The families of origin were abandoning. All kind of issues. It's all, okay, so that young person experiences all of these traumas, challenges, adversity. How are they supposed to feel going into a new place? They ha and that's what the Bible's saying. Don't let what's happened to you in this world determine who you are. Let what happens in the cubicle of transformation determine who you are. It's not making any sense. I often tell people in leadership development, tell me the reason why God can't use you, and I will show you someone in Scripture with your issue that God used. Never let the dysfunctions, the traumas that's happened to you or the mistakes that you have made or created for yourself be your limiting factor. So be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this word transformed, I want you to catch this. The Apostle Paul knew exactly what he was talking about with this word. It's the Greek word used to describe the process called metamorphosis. And it's a word that very few creations experience. For, there's a few. For example, it's something that happens when a caterpillar ends up becoming a butterfly. That is not incremental, subtle change. 
That is a radical change of kind. A caterpillar crawls, a butterfly flies. A caterpillar has all these tiny little legs and does not go very far. A caterpillar, or excuse me, a butterfly soars with long legs and changes perspective. A caterpillar has these dark eyes that don't see very well. A butterfly has compound eyes that sees brilliantly. There is truly not a little change, a radical change. And this is what Paul is saying. You may, have, you may crawl into this cocoon of transformation, but you can come out of it really different. And that's what this year is about, is creating a cocoon or a cubicle or an environment of transformation. And that's why I needed you to understand. It's not, you, I can tell you all kind of habits to do. But if you don't understand bonding first, the habits, the habits won't work. But the habits reinforce the bonding. I, I, you, you have to get, yeah, get the horse head of the cart there. But now watch this. A caterpillar, it doesn't go very far, but its primary focus is to eat, 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 and it stores up, stores up. When a caterpillar, a butterfly, a larva, when it's first born, it's often not bigger from a monarch butterfly. It's not bigger than a pin drop. It'll grow to 100 size, 100 times its size. And you know basic uh, elementary biology here. That caterpillar reaches a point it starts creating a cocoon. It starts spinning the silk cocoon. It starts creating this environment around itself, and pretty soon it shuts out the whole world, and it's this environment of transformation. And that's what God says for us, to create an environment for our lives that we enter into that becomes an environment of transformation, an environment that can change how we perceive our lives. Jesus did this. In the scripture, the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, I wish I had time to break this down for you, but you'll see it all out in scripture where you see people that truly had radical changes in their life. Jesus, the Bible says in Luke, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And there he was tempted by the devil. He, wrought, he fought out his identity. He wrestled through some things. But the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, at, he, he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. There was something that dynamically happened and Jesus started his ministry. Moses went to the backside of the wilderness, a murderer, embarrassed, and shamed. <laughs> Moses returned from the backside of the wilderness, a dynamic leader, world changer. David left the sheepfold and hiding in caves as a rejected young man, uh, 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 an unwelcomed young man, and in embraces and steps onto the stage as a king and a leader. It's in the cocoon of transformation that allows you to come out of that season that you've laid to say, God, I'm going to build this cocoon around my life for growth. And when you come out of it, you're not the same person that went in. You are not the same person. And so uh, here's what I want to invite you to do, because I want this, uh, I, this is not just a teaching, because how many, know we, how many know we'd like to be just changed in a day? Yeah, ever since the microwave, it's like, it's like, <laughs> It's like, let's put it in the microwave, wait for a minute, and pop it out. And that's what we do. It's like, can I go to church once and spend an hour with God and then pop it out? It's like, no, no, it's, it doesn't happen in a day, but it does happen daily. It doesn't happen in a day. And to help us get this year started, get this whole year started, because this is going to be something that I feel like God has really been speaking in my heart and, and really helping some of us to really lay the foundation that the next chapters and seasons of our lives are built on, then this is what we're going to do in the month of January. And here's what I want you to join me to do. There's four things I want you to join me to do this year. Number one, or excuse me, this month, not this year, just this month. Number one, I want you to spend and join me, join me for the next 21 days in a season of prayer and fasting. Now, some people will fast. It's like the new year. I want to lose some weight. No, prayer and fasting go together. It's not just simply abstaining from food to lose weight. No, fasting fasting is you're simply saying, God, I'm going to redeem some time in my life, and I'm going to give up this and spend that time with this. God, I'm going to give up this natural bread or this meal, and I'm going to spend some time with the bread of God. 
In other words, instead of taking my lunch hour, my 30 minutes, my hour to eat a lunch today, I'm going to take that same 30 minutes, that hour, and study and read your word today. I'm going to give up this for this. God, I'm going to give up my face from my screens and my television, and I'm going to give my face to you in prayer. I'm going to give my face to you. I'm, instead of giving my ears to talk radio in the car or listening to the oldies or whatever, I'm going to give my ears to that drive home or that drive to work in a spirit of worship and praise and celebration. I'm going to give up this for that because, God, I want to change the posture of my heart. I want to change my my. I want to just acknowledge, God, that I am dependent upon you. This is what fasting is all about. It's about simply saying, God, I cannot produce fruit without you. God, I'm creating a spiritual hunger. I'm creating a spiritual hunger. And some of you, if you were honest, if I'm honest, sometimes I don't have a spiritual hunger. I don't have a spiritual hunger. Jesus was asked one day, he says, why... Don't your disciples fast? And he said, that's easy. And he uses another example. Jesus was a storyteller. He says, when you're with the bridegroom, you're at the wedding, you're at the celebration, you don't fast, you party. I'm here with them. We're partying right now. It's a party. But I'll tell you when they fast, when I'm gone. When I'm gone, they'll fast. When you start feeling that connection weakening, when you start feeling you're getting unattached, when you start finding that the world starts shining brighter than Jesus shines, it's time to say, Jesus, I miss you. I miss you, Jesus. And the Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You have to bring the hunger. God says, I'll bring the meal. You bring the hunger. And I have to be honest. If I'm not hungry, I'm not abiding. If I don't create a cubicle of transformation, if I don't bring the hunger, I can sit here and try to encourage you to eat your broccoli, eat your broccoli like some parent I, preaching at you how to eat healthy, eat healthy, eat healthy, and it's like, I'm not interested. I'm going to have Cheetos and ding-dongs. That's what I want to eat. <laughs> Poison myself. <laughs> right? So, so to help you with this idea of a fast, we're asking you to do it for the next 21 days. And we, Pastor Roger, one of our pastors here, has created a, about a 10-minute video about fasting, and you can learn more about it. We'll talk more about it over the next week or two, but just encourage you to think about the next 21 days, about spending some time in fasting, and learn about it. Say, I don't know anything about fasting. Then study about it. There's all kind of fast. There's, 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 there's complete fast where you go without food for a period of time. It can be a day. It can be three days. It can be 21 days, it can be Jesus went for 40 days, Moses went for 40 days. It, it can be a partial fast where you give up certain things for a portion of the day or for a couple days. Um, and it can be other things than just food. Maybe, maybe I have to give up some of my time in social media so that I can have some time with God. I, I can give up some of other things. So I'm redeeming time. The idea is so I can spend time with God. And so I encourage you to check out that video and learn from it. For the, and we'll talk about this for the next 21 days. In Mark chapter 8, when Jesus finished, when Jesus was with his disciples, and he says, these people have been with me for three days, and I don't want to send them away because they've been fasting, they'd faint. So in other words, you might have to eat something to sustain yourself along the way, so it's, don't get legalistic with it. It's about hungering for God. But here's what I want you to catch with that. When those three days were over, Jesus did a miracle. If we spent the next 21 days as a church saying, God, we're going to hunger for you. We're going to seek you. We're going to create a cocoon of transformation. What kind of miracle might we see? What kind of miracle might you see? What kind of buds might start showing up in your life? What kind of desires might start emerging that you didn't even know that you had? What kind of fruit might start showing up in your life? It might not even be ripe at that time. But what kind of breakthroughs might take place? I'm talking about creating a cubic. Here's the second thing I want you to join me to do. I want you to read the Gospel of John over the next 21 days. There are 21 chapters in the book of John. And, and that's a great thing to just, just read a chapter a day. 
it's also a good reminder that what we're doing. It's like you're hearing me, and I know once you leave, you won't think about me until next week. No, this gives you a chance every day. I'm going to read, read from the Gospel of John, and it's going to remind me about creating a cubicle of transformation. It's going to start stimulating my spirituality, my faith. And, and, and John is a great book because you'll learn Jesus makes seven I am statements in there. He re- starts teaching you who he is. I am. I am. From chapters 13 to the rest of the book, it's the most intimate look into the life of Jesus as he spoke directly to his intimate community, his disciples, insights into who he was and how he thought of them and what he wanted for them in the journey to the cross. It's a beautiful insight. So you'll see who he is, the I am statements, and you'll also get to connect with him. Now, if you've already got a Bible reading plan, good for you. Just add one more chapter a day. If you don't have a Bible reading plan, here's a great one to get started with. And we'll do this together for the next 21 days. I spent my time and reading mine today. Here's the third thing I want you to do. We talked to you about this last week. I want you to write a letter to yourself. Now, I, I, if you got one of these last week, awesome. But if you did not receive one of these, I'll explain it to you. Usher's got some. So if you want one of these, just lift up your hand. And we'll make sure you get this. So go ahead. Can I, can I smell from my ushers? And so, yeah, so they're walking through. So they're coming, they're coming. But let me explain how this works. At the end of these 21 days, I want you to bring this letter back. Inside of this letter, some simple instruction about creating goals of transformation in seven areas of your life. Yeah, the ushers are awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. So as you take this, and you're spending time in fasting, you're spending time in prayer, you're spending time uh, connecting with God. Uh, come on, just, this is awesome. We gave, out a, we gave out a lot of these last week, but apparently uh, we still need a lot more. So ushers are awesome running around. But if you have not got one yet, just keep your hands up. Just keep your hands up, and we will make sure you get one. But what I need you to do, I need you to put your name and address on this envelope. I need you to put a stamp on this envelope. And I want you to write down what you're believing God for over the next year. There's seven areas you can write on there. You don't have to read all of them. But you write these goals, and you're going to bring them back. You're going to bring them back at the end of this month. We're going to collect them. And I and the pastors are going to pray over them every week. We're not going to open them. We're not going to read them. But every week, but we'll see your name. I'll see Christy's name on there. I'll see Randy's name on there. I'll see different names, and we'll just pray God. We'll just lay hands on them, and we'll spend time in our weekly prayer praying over what you're believing God for and keep it in front of us. You've got to keep the vision in front of you. You've got to keep things in front of you, and we'll, we'll continue to believe for you. And when you write down your goals, if you're not familiar with a little acronym, you should get familiar with it. You should be goal setters. It's a little acronym I like to use. It's called SMART. SMART goals. It's an acronym. S stands for be specific. Specific. Write a goal down specific. Now, a goal can be for yourself, what I want for me. A goal can be what I want for others, what God, I want God to do in somebody else's life. Or a goal can be even what I want for God. I have have goals for God. I know what God wants, so I want what God wants in some areas. There are some things I want for myself. There are things I want for others. So a goal needs to be specific. Is it for you? Is it for somebody else? Is it for God? The M starts for make it measurable. I just gave you one. Take the, take the Gospel of John, read it over the next 21 days. You can measure that. That's a simple way. Make a goal measurable so that you can know whether you're making progress towards those goals. So it's a goal that you can measure. It's quantifiable. The A stands for attainable. Okay, do it this way. Is this what I think I can accomplish this year? But then add to it. But, but this is what I can do with your help, God. This is what I think I can do. But God, this is what I think you're asking of me. This is what I think you, and pr- I promise you, whatever you think you can do, God's probably going to say double it, triple it, quadruple it. Because God has always done exceedingly abundantly above what I could think. But, but it's what you think is attainable what you think of as attainable. Because, but if you don't think it's attainable, then you'll just give up. You'll dismiss it. It just becomes a Santa Claus wish list. It requires participation. These goals require participation for you. 
the R stands for relevancy. And this is really, really important. In other words, this is the why, this is your goal. This is the reason behind it. If you don't really have the motivation, you'll just not think about it, you'll discard it. But, but it becomes the reason for why you want what you want. It's the driving force. Most people never tap in to the motivations of their life, the deepest motivations of their life. I will tell you, the shyest, quietest mama will turn into a grizzly bear if something touches one of her kids. Why? It accessed motivation. Most people never access the deepest cores of their motivation. They try to do what other people think they should do. They try to do what they think they should do. Most people never really activate and access the deepest core motivation of their life. I'll say it like this. Until you know what you would die for, you don't know what you would live for. What you would die for is a pretty small list. If you're trying to figure out all the things you can live for, well, there's all kind of lists. Smorgasbord out there. Which one of those do you want to die for? Also becomes a pretty small list. What often people find, I spend my life pursuing what doesn't matter and forsaking what really does matter. And become aware. That's the relevancy. And the last one, the T, is time. Give it time. And we're giving it a year this year. And what's going to happen? We're going to pray over these all year. So you're going to bring them back on the fourth, the fourth thing I'm going to ask you to do. On January 29th, we're going to have a special Sunday evening service after we go through this teaching together. We're creating this cubicle of transformation. I'm giving you all these things. They're learning styles. I'm trying to get you reading. I'm trying to get you thinking. I'm trying to get you praying. I'm trying to get you writing. I'm trying to get you thinking about this stuff. And I'm asking you to do something out of your norm, to come back to a special service. I'm, I'm disrupting your religious traditions. Come on, somebody. Look, I did not become a pastor to sit here and preach to a group of people who do nothing. No, no. I, do, I, do, I don't want to be a pastor of a church of people who do nothing. I don't care how many thousands of people come. We're not a church of do-nothing Christians. The verse I read to you earlier, herein is my Father glorified that I bear much fruit. My mission, that's my life purpose statement. Anybody that takes my leadership class know that's my life purpose statement. I refuse to accept a fruitless life because God is glorified when I bear much fruit. So guess what? God said he called someone like me to be pastor to equip you to do the work. <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. I'm putting you to work. But guess what? You enjoy the fruit that your life produces. You enjoy the fruit that your life produces. And so you're going to bring these back to a special service we're going to do on Sunday evening, January 29th. I have a dear friend of mine, Pastor Sergio De La Mora. He's going to talk about the transition he's been over. He's gone through an incredible transition in his life and what God has done in his life. And he's going to be here to share with us. We're going to pray. We have a night of worship and prayer. It's going to be an incredible celebration. And, and, um, and we're going to collect these from you. And as I mentioned, we're going to pray over them all year. And in January of 2024, we're going to mail these letters back to you. We're going to mail these back to you. And you're going to open them up, and you're going to see what God has done in your life over the last 12 months. Amen. Can you stand to your feet? I told you earlier I wanted to pray for you. Why don't you close your eyes for a moment? And I know that some of you, when I was talking about the orphan heart, you started saying, that's me. I don't feel like I fit. I don't feel like I belong. I don't know that God loves me. I want him to love me. I don't know that God is for me. I've messed up so bad. I've done so many things. And you struggle with an orphan's heart. If that's you with the eyes closed, just say, Pastor, I'm dealing with an orphan's heart. I don't know where I fit. I don't know where I belong. I just want you to lift up your hand right now because I want to pray for you because I want to see God bring healing into this place. I want to see God bring healing into your life. Thank God for these hands. Thank, for, thank God. Because I've dealt with it at different times in my own life. So, Father... I pray right now for every hand that is raised. I pray for every person that's fighting this battle. I thank you, God, that they know that they know that they know you love them. I pray, God, that they know that you care deeply about them. I pray that your love doesn't become a theory, but your love becomes something they experience in practical application. Father, I thank you that your power is being revealed to them, that there's growing in this new place of acceptance, this new place of uh, 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 love this new place of awareness of who you are in their life God and I pray for the Holy Spirit to do what you said I will not leave you orphans and I pray God there's a bonding that is taking place 
in the incredible name of Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to go back into worship. I'm going to invite my prayer team to come. And if you're here and you need prayer for anything, you need healing, you need wisdom, you're facing something, you got something you're carrying, this is a house of prayer. And this is why we do this. You're like, what, why are we doing this? Because God wants you to be prayed for. God wants his church to be a place of prayer. So as we go back into worship, if you need prayer for anything, there's people in front that would love to pray with you. So make your way to the front. Let us pray. Let's worship.